Um, I um, have these five sections of this talk. I um, understand there's an audience that's very diverse, some people um, of the general public and, and a lot of uh, members of this community. So I uh, hope that everyone can get something out of it. I'll start with uh, a pretty basic introduction and then um, go a little bit into the past of this field and then talk a little bit about um, from a histor history or a sociology or science perspective, how do fields actually emerge and what do we know about this and where can we then locate ourselves in this process um, that leads us to arrive in the present and also um, allows us to take an outlook into the future. And then I'll end with a couple of comments on some structural issues in the organization of science that I think have affected us as a field, but that I think we can also contribute to um, to remedying eventually. So what is nuclear fusion? Um, I wonder whether we can dim the light a little bit more to increase the contrast of the slides. Yeah, thank you. So uh, starting with the basics here, I'll focus on the DD reaction, which is the, the reaction um, that's most discussed in our field, uh, two deuterons. Professor Meissner already talked about uh, this reaction. Um, two deuterons come together and they form um, one out of three products, either helium-3 and a neutron, um, or uh, a triton and a proton, um, or a helium-4, and um, there is this um, branching ratio of 50%, 50%, and then a small fraction for the, for the later branch, and um, we can keep that branching ratio in mind because later we'll come across research of Professor Chesky's group that, that uh, has demonstrated that this branching ratio might not be uh, written in stone. Um, of course, there is this enormous density that comes from the release of, of, of nuclear binding energy, that, that mass difference that, um, that uh, results from, from, from fusing nuclei together, which then uh, gets tr converted into, into energy. So here we see the E equals mc squared, uh, that relationship um, from a letter from Einstein. So what's the, the challenge then? Uh, well, if we bring nuclei together that are positively charged, we have um, this kind of uh, repulsion. And uh, it's well known that in the sun, this is overcome um, through a combination of, of density, increased density through gravity and um, and uh, also kinetic energy of, of the, these ions, um, uh, which we perceive as temperature. And, uh, and so here you see the temperature distribution of the sun. So the, the sun has been this kind of model of how we think about nuclear fusion for the longest time. And, and the, uh, I'm sure you've seen it all in the press when there's now a lot of these fusion startups, the, the story is usually they try to create a sun on Earth. And so the first tokamak reactor, the most uh, common approach to this was created in the 1950s. And in the tokamak you have these uh, nuclei that are then racing around. Um, and so you have certain temperature constraints, otherwise the whole thing you know, melts away. And so, uh, and then you have the, the reaction probability, which is usually treated as given at a, at a sp uh, specific kinetic energy. And so what you have as a lever is to increase the density so, so as to increase the fusion rate. And um, so that then connects the field of nuclear fusion traditionally very closely with the field, the physics subfield of plasma physics. And just for, for those uh, less familiar with physics, so some of the work that plasma physicists do is to, to model the way um, particles move inside a plasma, the kind of dynamics, this like hydrodynamics-like um, uh, turbulences that, that can be modeled and that can be uh, attempted to be controlled. And, and so that's this kind of marriage between the field of nuclear fusion and, and the field of plasma physics. And here is a table, not sure how well it can be seen, but that's like, these are the, the nine categories um, of the nine subfields of physics according to the American Physical Society. And I highlighted here the one that includes plasma physics. And so again, that is the, 
the subfield of physics that's been most closely associated with, with, uh, with fusion. Now, people from the early days on have thought about whether a metal lattice could be helpful in, in bringing together nuclei and catalyzing nuclear fusion. And so here you see uh, an early paper uh, from 1926 in Naturwissenschaften, which was later published in English and Nature as well, where the idea of using a palladium lattice was already um, articulated uh, by the chemist Fritz Hanet, uh, who's based in Berlin, I think. Um, so how does the situation look differently when we have a lattice? We have then the, the metal lattice host uh, atoms or, or nuclei, and then in between we can have lighter nuclei um, that, uh, that we then seek to, to bring together and, and have fuse. And so the temperature is much more constrained, of course, in this case, because otherwise our host metal lattice would melt away. The density is higher than in the plasma. Uh, but uh, there's, it's also constrained. And so the only lever in this approximation for the fusion rate equation is then to, to change the reaction probability. And uh, that is where our efforts from a theoretical point of view have, have all been focused on. And, um, and so if we then think about the areas of physics that become relevant here, there's condensed matter physics that looks at the way lattices form and the way lattice, lattices change with boundary conditions such as temperature and pressure. Um, there is, then one can introduce dynamics and think about how uh, smaller nuclei or smaller atoms diffuse in a lattice, um, like uh, what's been done in this paper, um, including also the diffusion of defects. There is, um, uh, more global dynamics, like here there's a, a visualization of, of uh, an actual uh, femtosecond electron microscope a video of phonons in a germanium crystal. Um, here's a simulation of what sort of how that could be visualized in a, in a cartoon. Um, there, there's also a collective quantum effects. So, so far we've visualized the uh, atoms only as little balls, but Really, they should be thought of much more complex, more like liquid-like or uh, more abstract type of objects. Um, there's a, a nice group at the MIT math department that does these um, hydrodynamic analogs of, um, of uh, quantum effects. So this is a demonstration of super radiance through a hydrodynamic analog where a field acts, interacts with uh, two two-level systems. Um, and then, so far, we've considered atoms, but then we also need to look at the center of atoms. Um, and so at the center of atoms is the nucleus, and the nucleus itself has these kind of dynamics. I showed here this nuclear density functional theory generated video, which kind of is the, shows the nucleus kind of wobbling around. So there, if we want to think about nuclear fusion in a lattice, there's a whole set of different physics subfields that become relevant here. I've highlighted here nuclear physics, atomic and molecular physics, condensed matter physics, um, quantum optics. So, so maybe no wonder there has been such a, um, such a chasm between the traditional approaches to nuclear fusion that was so closely tied to plasma physics and, and, and what we were doing. Um, there is a nice paper in 2019 um, of scientometric uh, paper that uh, analyzed uh, how much physicists uh, stray from their original fields. And uh, this paper found that here the area of the first year of a researcher marks the rest of her career in, in, in the physics publications that they've analyzed over several decades. Um, they also looked at, so this matrix shows these different fields um, on the, um, the y-axis at the beginning of people's career and where they were publishing in and uh, at the end of their career at the bottom and uh, even actually from researchers who started publishing in the 80s there is some sort of migration at times even though you see the diagonal is where most, most people stay in their own field but then actually if we go into the 90s and the 2000s it becomes even more concentrated on the diagonals. That means that people move even less across these subfields of physics. And that there's especially little, very little interaction and migration between nuclear physics on the one hand and condensed matter physics 
Okay, so I, I wanted to present this backdrop to help you maybe appreciate a little bit more why the results that I'm going to go over quickly um, will why they have they had trouble being received. Let's put it this way. So, um, so I said fusion in the past. I'm going to show you a bunch of iconic experiments. Um, of course, this is just going to be a selection. It can't be comprehensive in this format. But I just want to emphasize here that there have been a large variety of different experimental configurations, electrolysis, gas-loaded experiments, uh, low-energy ion mm -hmm. bombardments, like what Kohat's group has specialized in. And then there's also a large variety of, of characterization modes. Um, people look at heat or energetic particles, you know, element formation. But at the, at the level of the lattice, we can think of these as very similar systems, even macroscopically, they're, they're, they're generated differently, and there are different diagnostics put to, to work. Um, so here, maybe the most iconic experiments is the 1989 flashback Ponce experiments, here reported in 1990 in more detail, um, where there was this um, uh, palladium foil that's been electrochemically charged with, with deuterium and the researchers reported this big um, increase in, uh, in temperature which uh, over a longer period of time corresponded to about 20 megajoules of energy which is about more than 100 times what would have been expected from the chemical reaction of the, the, the deuterium the, um, in, the, in that system. So that was the sort of initial uh, trigger. Um, a similar experiment was later shown to uh, or suggested to have uh, uh, produced helium-4, uh, which is here shown in, in commensurate amounts to the um, amount of uh, excess heat that, that was measured. Um, there is also similar experiments where neutron detectors uh, went off next to the detectors, showed these kind of bursts you see on the right. Uh, compared to uh, background ones here shown on the left. Um, there were um, similar experiments where um, solid state track detectors were used with, um, with characteristic uh, tracks of neutron-induced reactions um, that, 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 that look very similar to, to neutron-induced tracks from a known source. Um, and then there is um, the ion beam work in, where um, Konrad Jaski's group is, is, uh, is um, I think it's fair to say, the, the leading group in, in the world in this area that have shown that if you come actually down from uh, deuteron energy levels at, uh, in the realm of, of, of traditional uh, nuclear fusion research and you come down, the um, reaction rates are actually higher than what you would conventionally expect. So, the, so this reaction probability uh, is indeed not uh, as simple as people might have assumed and it's a, a complex thing and it's affected by the surrounding environment. Um, here is also uh, work from Konrad's group on the right. Um, it's hard to see, I'm just going to tell you what it is. It's a change in branching ratio as a function of, um, or as a, in, as a function of energy um, at the low energy regime um, as, and as, um, as dependent on the environment. And then um, there are experiments that show various morphological features like craters on the surface and also elemental analysis suggests that um, there is um, a transmutation, this formation of, of low, low Z elements, uh, for instance, in this experiment. So people have um, put forth various criticisms of these experiments and, 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 and that, that, uh, that has been sometimes fair and sometimes not so fair. Um, but I think one can say it's a fact that there's a large body of experimental reports and taken together, uh, this body of experimental reports strongly suggests the presence of anomalies. And still there is continued controversy. There's, there's of course, a lack of funding, a lack of coverage, a lack of publicity, um, which might be, um, might be appropriate. Uh, which, if, if the claims here are true, then one would expect a lot more this way of funding and tension, uh, especially if you look now at the, the thermonuclear uh, fusion industry. And, um, and so I think that will have to lead us to, to, to state that yeah, there isn't, this hasn't really fully formed as a field, or this hasn't fully emerged as a field, otherwise there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be this controversy. 
Um, and so I'm saying here there is, there's been not enough convergent yet to convergence around a, a reference experiment and also an actual explanation as to what's going on. And so that motivates here this little intermezzo um, where I ask, okay, how do, how do fields emerge? What do we know about this and what might we learn about this or how can we locate our own fields uh, evolution in, 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 in that regard? And so I'm going to quickly talk about uh, uh, some research I did, some more history of science research on the history of the transistor, which is, of course, the basis for the computer chip. And it's, um, it's typically the invention of the transistor or the emergence of the semiconductor field is typically associated with the date 1947-48, when um, there was a, actually, 48 was the physical review letter by, um, by the three inventors, uh, three scientists at Bell Labs that were later uh, described as the inventors and, um, and received Nobel Prizes. Um, so they're seen here. Um, uh, there's also this narrative around this, um, uh, around this invention uh, period uh, as being the magic months where um, people, um, these, these geniuses in what was sometimes called the house of magic, Bell Labs, so came up with this, with this brilliant idea. Um, but then actually, if one looks a little bit deeper, there were, um, there were actually anomaly reports of uh, amplification, unexpected amplification in solid state, um, uh, material solid state um, crystals uh, already as early as the late 1910s. And, and so these reports have been published, but their mechanism was unknown. There were um, transistor patents as early as the 1925, or they were not called transistors, but solid state amplifiers. And so this led some science um, commentators, like uh, the editor of Radio News, Hugo Gansbach, in 1925, to state the semiconductor crystal now replaces the vacuum tube. This is a revolutionary invention. Um, and this explains how some radio experimenters have been able to obtain such remarkable long distance records by unexpected amplification. And then even several years later, you had other uh, here, other um, commentators here, the famous physicist Wolfgang Pauli, say, no, one shouldn't work on semiconductors. He discourages students to work on this. It's such a mess. Who knows whether semiconductors even exist? Um, and so you see maybe these parallels to this field. There was this controversy, this ambiguity, this, this, this um, lack of clarity, what, whether there are anomalies, whether what is the potential, whether there is our potential explanations, or whether something's actionable. And so um, this period, this pre-period, um, this is, um, let me see if I can point here. No, I'm just gonna uh, describe this. So this, this pre-period before 1948 was also marked by, there were several thousand publications in total on, um, uh, on, um, on the semiconductor crystals. And, um, and so, the, so there was a whole lot of activity, but you can also see in this, in this graph at the top, which are the publications over the years, that it, this really took off in 1948. Um, 40, uh, and, and so that's kind of marks an inflection point where the field has really fully formed and, and uh, overcome this, this ambiguous period. And so, yeah, so this was marked by this 1948 physical review letter. Um, and, and afterwards then you had, um, you had a follow-on innovation and moving towards the MOSFET transistor. So if we look at this pre-period more, there is, there's basically insights that have been gained about um, anomalies. So I've, I've kind of listed here a bunch of different key insights um, uh, about people having learned more and more to produce anomalies reliably um, and in different materials and different settings. Um, people learned about these kind of materials, for instance, how to grow single crystals and the importance of single crystals, the uh, relevance of elemental uh, semiconductors like germanium and silicon, and then also the de commensurate development of theory and um, sort of band structure theory derived from solid state physics. And so um, you, had, you had all these developments and then you had this eventually this integration effort by Bell Labs. So Bell Labs, um, and these uh, folks in the solid state physics group, they were not the people that invented the transistor out of nothing, but they were ba basically very good at tapping into these various communities and following this, this cumulative 
um, this buildup of knowledge and then and then integrating it and, and 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 making it actionable. And so what you had with this 1948 physical review letter was, for the first time, reasonable understanding of what's happening and also a reasonable reliability in, in generating the effect. And that caused that kind of phase change in the field and, and that uh, expansion of, of, of activity. And so I think th there are some parallels. And, and so I've tried to make a similar timeline um, for our field where several, you know, over the, the years, uh, since especially since 1989, different designs or different experiments have emerged or different modalities of experiments. And also different kind of knowledge has been gained both when it comes to um, in this case, uh, uh, producing anomalies or producing uh, anomalous observations um, and, in different configurations, um, but also in a better understanding metal hydrides, um, uh, how to have more control over producing certain materials, both by this community and also by other researchers working or interested in metal hydrides for, for other reasons. Um, and then also the development of, of theory and the integration of knowledge across these different uh, physics subfields. And so, um, so I think one, maybe what also uh, similar, maybe Sukhanov means something similar when he says, I think we're close. I, I think, I also think we're close. I think there is a, maybe the opportunity now for a similar type of integration um, of knowledge that has been gained and has been accumulated in a, maybe initially in a less coordinated way, but, but that, that can now be brought together. And, uh, and in recent, in, like, right now and in recent years, we've, we've seen activity from uh, quite eminent organizations and groups um, in this space. I mean, uh, these are all organizations that have been involved in solid state fusion or cold fusion research, if you like. Um, and, um, and also, uh, there, there was a very nice, uh, uh, top-tier journal peer-reviewed um, article by Konrad recently, but there's a really nice experimental work and the dissertation of Eric Zim at the University of Illinois, for instance. There's a solid-state fusion website that starts to collect and aggregate knowledge and present having different sort of public face to this all. So there's interesting and exciting developments. And so we could maybe um, speculate a bit and say what could come out of this. One possible scenario, painting here is to, to say, well, I, I think it's quite likely that there will be one or several high-level experimental publications in the coming years that, that deal with the kind of criticism that has been uh, articulated, that there needs to be more detailed diagnostics, there needs to be more detailed characterization of samples, higher reproducibility, better controls, longer runs, these kind of things. Um, I, I, I think it's also likely that there'll be further convergence of knowledge across condensed matter physics, nuclear physics, and quantum optics. Um, um, I think it's really fascinating to see your theory development in Conrad, but also the work I'm most familiar with, uh, Peter Hagelstein at, at MIT, and also the sort of touch points between uh, those, but then also the touch points with other communities like the um, um, quantum batteries community, the, the accelerated exciton diffusion community that looks at organic solar cells and the, the um, nuclear quantum dynamics uh, community. Uh, so, so I think there's uh, exciting uh, opportunities there. And uh, if that is indeed the case, then, then for sure resources will flow into this area, new research programs will open up and, um, and research on solid state fusion will become uh, institutionalized. And that, I think, is when systematic technology development commences. I think this is when you have a TRL level. I think right now we don't have a TRL level. We're in this pre-period where we're working towards that. Um, and uh, okay, so I I thought a little bit. Okay, what might me what I uh, what might we be able to expect from solid state fusion technology? And here, I think it's this is really just a bit of a back of the envelope thinking, but. Um, uh, I think it could be interesting and, and fun to, and useful to engage in this uh, from time to time. Um, uh, if we look at the Japanese nanoparticle results, um, where, you, where um, there is a, a large temperature difference um, from these uh, gas-loaded nanoparticles, um, and that if we can, um, if we 
read those reports, they, it seems to be quite um, stable and, and reliable, uh, and we can quantify that. So we, um, let me uh, focus on this here. I mean, uh, if we look at their, um, their reports, for instance, 90 watts uh, over a period of 25 days, that's about 53 kilowatt hours, um, 190 megajoules, that's about 10 kV per deuteron. Um, so that's far beyond the chemical limit. Um, and if uh, in this kind of sample, if we assume a DD reaction to take place, then that's about one out of every 2,000 deuterons we're taking. So if we now assume that with greater understanding of these systems and uh, uh, theoretical mechanisms that inform modeling, then uh, we could sort of dream up and think about what could be maybe a, a, an upper limit in terms of the efficiency. Um, so I'm, here I'm painting a picture of, say, a 25 by 25 millimeter thin film of 100 nanometer palladium with 10% vacancies. And if we assume these vacancies are filled with deutrons and uh, one out of every 10 um, vacancy sites has a, a DD reaction that's then induced in this case by a three milliwatt laser, similar to the Massimo Matteo or Bibarian uh, experiments, uh, then we can sort of put a ballpark number on this if we have several of these layers stacked in a system of say, um, in this case, eight kilowatt hour total capacity for small cube basically uh, of uh, less than a cubic inch um, and one could articulate a cost target and one could talk about how much fuel and, and, and helium waste this would produce. But I think, you know, this is all kind of dreaming and envisioning things, but it, it could be helpful um, as long as we qualify that, you know, um, this is not where we're at, but this is what kind of we're striving uh, for. Okay, and I think ultimately what these systems are, they're, they're, they're systems with complex physics but simple engineering compared to thermonuclear fusion approaches, which in, in, in many ways have simple physics, at least the, the nuclear physics is very simple, um, uh, not, the, not necessarily the plasma physics, but, but, if we, but, but, but if we count that to engineering, then it's, it's very complex engineering. And so these, um, this has the potential, this approach to have these integrated, disposable um, systems that are, that are maybe one can almost say inspired by nature because that's what, how nature works, right? You have these you have very, in the leaf, for instance, very complicated, very complex physics, but, but, but quite simple engineering, simple materials. Okay, so let me move to the last part here. Um, uh, structural issues in the organization of science that, that I think have affected us and that, that um, as we are now talking about getting closer to an inflection point and, and becoming part of mainstream science, that, that maybe the things that have affected us and have slowed this field down might also be things that we can, we can point out and, 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 and help to avoid for other, other developments in science that, 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 have, uh, that have been slowed down similarly. So I've already pointed out, so I'm just gonna list a bunch of points here. This one here is discovery as a, it should be seen as a social process rather than this flash of genius picture that uh, Bell Labs has so actively cultivated through their IP department and their PR department that have focused always the, the geniuses um, and not the kind of long social process that has contributed this cumulative knowledge that was later integrated. There is also another thing here is that science today is not working as well as many think it is. There was a nice paper in Nature earlier this year, uh, also a scientometric paper, where this group of researchers kind of uh, quantified the disruptiveness of different papers and patents, and, and they find that across different fields, the disruptiveness has been going down uh, over the last decades. And so you would think we have more researchers working in in science globally today than ever before, but the, uh, the overall disruptiveness of, of developments is going down. Um, this is maybe less surprising if we, if we take a lesson from Thomas Kuhn, the philosopher of science, um, here in this um, essay, The Essential Tension. He uh, uh, wrote such things as the education in the natural sciences remains a dogmatic initiation in a pre-established tradition that the student is not equipped to evaluate. The single most striking feature of science education is that to an extent totally unknown in other creative fields, it is conducted entirely through textbooks. 
and the practitioner for mature science does not pause to examine divergent modes of explanation um, or experimentation. Uh, there are, there's a movement today of people coming from the sciences, some people also coming from the venture capital world that have, have that are frustrated by this stagnation in science, um, and that have started to think about how a scientific institution can and should be changed and improved. So in this essay by Michael Nielsen and Ken Chun Chu, um, the authors state, science is badly bottlenecked on field formation. In particular, we believe current social processes in science are designed to support work in existing fields, but strongly inhibit work critical to the creation of new fields. So think again about these, these buckets, the stove piping, these silos in, in physics that the uh, earlier centrometric paper pointed out. Um, these authors also state that um, understanding early signals that a new field is steering and designing to detect and support those signals, that's what new programs should do. And we believe many such signals are actively selected against in existing funding programs and selecting for them would unlock tremendous latent potential for discovery work. So this kind of thinking, if it propagates, would have certainly helped this field, I think. There's a, also, rampant problem of many scientists, I think, having a poor understanding of reproducibility. There are some good articles about this, this article in Catalysis about reproducibility and its challenges, but I mean, everyone knows it in a sense intuitively from, uh, Rob Christian has pointed out this example of making a souffle and the souffle, you follow all the steps in the cookbook, but it's just not working out. Mm -hmm. And so that is the issue of tacit knowledge and, and omitted or hidden variables. Uh, Michael Polanyi, chemist has written about this uh, very prominently. Um, that seems to be poorly understood. Um, uh, we see this uh, with other examples as well. There is a problem I think scientists have with, um, a lot of scientists with uh, ambiguity. Uh, here are two papers by philosophers that build on Husserl and Heidegger talking about ambiguity, um, also connected to neuroscience and the so-called Bayesian brain hypothesis. So if you have a, a pattern like these points here, and you, get, you add additional data points, you may interpret these points as different kind of patterns. Uh, you add more points, and, and then some people, more than others, tempted to make a judgment call and say this is a cat or this is a, a rooster, but uh, sometimes it's maybe not appropriate to make that judgment call, and sometimes I think we should tolerate ambiguity as scientists for months and for years and maybe for decades, and I think in the, Formation of this field, or in the, in the case of this field, certainly the need of some certain physicists to make a, a judgment call early, much earlier than maybe was that certainly was warranted, uh, has caused much damage. Um, there's an interesting paper by, a, by psychologists about the role of cynicism. Um, so here from the abstract, um, these four studies um, show that people tend to believe in cynical individuals' cognitive superiori superiority. So, uh, but then actual follow-up research shows that cynical versus less cynical individuals generally do worse on cognitive ability and academic competency tasks, but cynicism is often used as a defense mechanism to cover up insecurities. Um, there is a very interesting paper by a friend of mine, Harald Atmansbacher, who's a retired professor at ETH, scientific research between orthodoxy and anom anomaly, uh, where he distinguishes between two different types of anomalies. I've kind of tried to visualize, well, you can barely see it here. You, there's anomalies that are close to the frontier of established knowledge, knowledge and anomalies that are farther out. So that's, I think, an important distinction. And, and, and Harald basically says, uh, if you're if, if, if you deal with anomalies that are too far from the frontier of knowledge, then they become a, a, a not actionable. And, and so uh, I think we were in this kind of situation. I think that, can, that explains some of the, the, um, uh, the inaction around this field, um, the apathy. But, um, but I think, again, when, when you think about this kind of cumulative knowledge that has been gained, um, over the last decades, I think the knowledge frontier has moved closer to the kind of anomalies that have been reported, and I think that makes makes it more actionable. So, um, and then finally, 
there is uh, this really interesting paper by a psychology professor. Why are, the title is, Why are modern scientists so dull? And how science selects for perseverance and sociability at the expense of intelligence and creativity. Um, so here I just read some excerpts. Industrious and socially adept individuals better suit. Um, so um, the argument is that the current incentives and, and uh, advancement mechanisms they select for industrious and socially adept individuals, which are better suited to incremental science rather than revolutionary science. Um, and the argument here is that creativity is probably associated with independence from group norms, impulsivity, and sensation seeking with a style of cognition that influence, involves fluent, associative, and rapid production of many ideas. That reminds me very much of these conferences. Um, and maybe one, the one or the other of you may find themselves described here in the sentence elite. Revolutionary science should therefore be a place that welcomes brilliant, impulsive, inspired, and antisocial oddballs, <laughs> so long as they are also dedicated truth seekers. Okay, so I think that suggests that also there, this is the small literature of the, of the personality psychology literature that deals with the personality psychology of scientists. And I think there, this suggests that there, we can we think about different groups of scientists. There, there's some scientists who are more builders who, who like to do normal science in the words of Thomas Kuhn and, do, and, and sort of explore within the, within the frontier of established knowledge and then there are more the scouts and of course I think our community here is, is, is full of scouts and I think what is needed is to kind of connect the scouts and the builders and that, that is done by integrators and I think the ARPA-E program is, is aiming to do that. Um, there's, so there's been a lot of criticism now of the existing institutions of science, but I think also uh, as outsiders or as scouts, one needs to keep in mind that there's also responsibilities, namely uh, making information readily digestible is a form of empathy, um, something that Metrophysics likes to um, emphasize, consider to teach, convincing others is, is different from gaining understanding for oneself, and both are important. Um, excluding alternative explanations require careful and often tedious work, so someone has to do that as well before moving on to the next, the next uh, shiny thing. And also avoiding narcissism. So we talked about cynicism among certain people, which is damaging, but a narcissism can also be damaging, and, and I mean here both overt narcissism, which is associated with grandiosity, and also covert narcissism which is associated with victimization. Okay, so this is an area I'm exploring more with some of my colleagues. I'm, I should have said earlier, I'm, I'm a nuclear engineer, but I'm also an innovation researcher at MIT at the Industrial Innovation, uh, at the Industrial Performance Center. And um, so, so this is a little bit of an in, a glimpse into what we're doing there. Um, so this would suggest that science and innovation policy can bring together mixed teams scouts and builders um, and, and integrators, create protected spaces where new ideas can be tested without being smothered by incumbents, incumbent scientists. I think that's also what the RPE program is doing. Encourage a balance between exploration and exploitation, between understanding and convincing, and also provide greater awareness of history, philosophy, and methodology in the education of scientists. Okay, so with that I want to conclude. Um, so we've covered quite a bunch of topics. I hope that some of you in the field have gotten something out of it and some of you from the general public have learned something. Um, I just want to say what a ride we have all been on. I mean, with this, with this field and with this, um, both the, the dynamics in terms of the science and also the dynamics in terms of the social processes involved here and also, with the, of course, with the potential impact um, that we're seeking. So I agree with Conrad. I think we might be able to witness in the near future an inflection point in this field, in the formation of this field, or in the completion of the, the initial formation of this field. Um, there is potential for a new technology that, as in the words of RPE, may be an ideal form of nuclear energy, and as such would change the world in myriad ways. Um, and this community, has been affected by dysfunctions in the science ecosystem. But I think, 
And I think that's important to acknowledge and point out as this field progresses. And uh, I know many of you have already recognized this and also intend to continue to document this and to talk about this so <coughs> we can uh, avoid these kind of things uh, continuing. And so I think this is also, our field may also be an interesting case, uh, maybe a central case that can contribute to, to not just changing the energy space, but also changing the way science is done and organized and thought about. Thank you.